Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Aaron Broshi. Aaron is, uh, along with me and a few other people in the audience, member of the advisory board for the Initiative for Health Systems Innovation. So he and I and others deserve a lot of credit. No, we don't really, but uh, Anna and Retsif and others deserve a lot of credit. I'm just trying to ride their coattails here. But uh, Aaron is on the advisory board with me. Um, He's a senior healthcare executive, uh, strategically focused with a 30-year track record of building leading high-growth public and private healthcare businesses. Over the past seven years, Aaron has par partnered with selected private security firms to support their investment efforts and is currently chairman of ERT and a leading, da a leading data and technology provider for clinical drug development. Um, and chairman of Derm Wright, a leading skin and wound care manufacturer. He also sits on the board of Magellan Health, FDNA, and several other corporations. Um, Aaron is going, he, he's uh, involved with Inventive Health. Uh, he spent 14 years at Boston Consulting prior to Inventive Health. And at BCG, he was managing partner responsible for the firm's healthcare practice across the Americas. Uh, Aaron is going to lead a panel discussion uh, focused on MIT's uh, growing ecosystem for digital health innovation, and I'm going to ask Aaron to please introduce the panel to the audience. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. By, just by virtue of, of hearing the 30 years, you guys know that I'm really not a digital by age demographic alone, sort of not really a digital type of person, but uh, we're going to try to make a go of it here, and thankfully we have a, a terrific panel with us. We have uh, Christiane to my left, uh, the Chief Medical Officer of Health Reveal, uh, and she'll talk more about it, but monitoring and managing chronic diseases, leveraging big data, uh, as you'll hear, um, and uh, has quite a, quite a background as an emergency room or emergency medicine physician and a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in computer science and engineering from, from MIT. Um, Elliot Cohen, co-founder and CTO of PillPack. Um, PillPack's a full-service pharmacy. Elliot will describe it in more detail. Very innovative, very disruptive model. Um, came out of uh, UC Berkeley with a computer science and neuroscience background, an MBA out of Sloan, and also was very active as a co-founder of Hacking Medicine program here at MIT. And then uh, Liz Bohm, uh, who is the director of research at Vocero's Experience Innovation Network. She will describe more exactly what the Experience Innovation Network does. It's uh, part of uh, Vasera, but really a very, very different uh, focus in terms of uh, working primarily with health systems, hospitals, uh, providers uh, in, uh, in managing the patient uh, experience uh, in, in aggregate. Um, previously spent a number of years at Forrester as the uh, leading global healthcare research uh, analyst and uh, has a bachelor's out of, out of Amherst, so a, a great panel. Um, what I wanted to start with, maybe just to set the stage, I know we heard a bunch of different um, discussions earlier in the day that focused on particular components and, and, and pieces of, of how digital kind of fits in. I wanted to start with just some macro data stats to maybe put, put all of that in perspective before we get into some specific solutions that, uh, that uh, some of these folks here uh, represent. So uh, maybe starting on the supply side, overall digital adoption uh, growing rapidly. So this is data from IQVIA. Um, 318,000 health apps out there. Um, roughly twice the number of health apps that were out a year earlier in 2015, and 200 new health apps are being added each day. Um, thankfully, about 40 of them make up about 50% of all the downloads, so it's, it is mass, uh, you know, mass uh, availability, but, uh, but few that seem to be getting a lot of traction. The general wellness apps are the majority of these apps, but those focused on health condition management are growing, and now about 40% of all the apps and over half of all the apps that, uh, that use sensor data, which obviously is important to support condition management, chronic care management, and significant consumer adoption of wearables like Fitbit and Jawbone and so on, and obviously a lot of innovation in that whole sensor area. From the consumer angle, so more from the demand side, um, data here from Rock Health 2017 survey, where they at least exclaimed that digital health is reaching the tipping point in 2016 almost half of all consumers are now considered active digital health adopters, um, up from about 20% a year ago. And um, only 12% of Americans are non-adopters, so down from 20%. So everybody's using it. Video-based telemedicine has tripled from 7% to now 22% uh, 
uh, of Americans uh, using telemedicine in some fashion. About every fourth American has a wearable. Um, and um, you know, a lot of uh, novel technologies, virtual and augmented reality are being adopted, even though the numbers are still small, but being adopted for relaxation, mental health, rehab, and pain management, three to six, seven percent of consumers. Um, and interestingly enough, and we'll talk a little bit about the data challenges, but you know, consumers are less concerned about privacy and security. If you, if you do a consumer survey, almost three quarters of all consumers uh, would, uh, would be very interested in sharing their healthcare information especially if it helped get better care from, from their physician. Um, so look, I think we all understand that the potential for better digital health technology adoption um, is enormous in terms of both empowering consumers but also allowing payers, providers, uh, technology companies to, uh, to understand where, the, where there are opportunities to measure effectiveness, to measure outcomes, to manage chronic diseases. And I think some other panel talked a bit about the potential of moving healthcare towards where maybe retail is today or banking is today. We're a very far way off from that, um, although some of these stats would suggest that, that it's the adoption is, is widespread. And we all, I think we all know some of the barriers in terms of, uh, I think the, uh, the gentleman from, uh, from Kaiser touched on this in terms of consumer apps, the uptake engagement outcomes challenge. Clinicians, um, while well, 26% of clinicians um, recommend some kind of patient engagement technology, only 13% of physicians use themselves some remote patient monitoring technology. Um, and the barriers are all around, you know, uh, com complexity around app selection, concerns around privacy, around security, around li liability, lack of financial incentives, and lack of, of integration in, in the workflow. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you read the analyst reports, um, the outlook is very bullish, that 20% of all health systems are using in, in, in some fashion and moving from just pilot programs to full-scale rollout and adoption of, of a lot of these digital technologies. And the expectation that over the next five to 10 years, just about all key healthcare systems are going to be employing in a, in a meaningful way health, digital health technology. So that's, that's the, micro, the macro kind of view, at least from the analyst community. Question a little bit is it, you know, what's the hype versus the, the reality? And I, and I think, you know, maybe to, to start off kind of on our panel, it, I'd like to kind of maybe ask Chris to start us off and talk a bit about Health Reveal and what Health Reveal does. Uh, we'll, we'll ask Elliot to do, to do the same then. Um, how it works, what the value proposition is, can you give a little, little overview? Sure, absolutely, thanks. Thanks for having me today. Um, Health Reveal is uh, started in 2015 by Lonnie Reisman and it's an early stage digital health company. We really are focused on trying to improve the care to patients with chronic health conditions. And we want to be able to preempt the development of avoidable consequences of their health conditions, such as stroke, heart failure hospitalization, heart attacks, and that while improving the care of patients, decreases health care costs. So it's, it's best for the patient and best all around. And the way that we do that is by aggregating all available health data on patients, and then we apply clinical analytics that have a foundation in evidence-based best practices. And what that means is that we're looking at what professional societies have come together and deemed as effective for patient care in those conditions. Um, which the literature shows half the patients are not actually receiving those evidence-based guidelines. Uh, and then finally, from those analytics, we're deriving actionable insights that are at the individual patient level. So not that uh, you, know, you have um, problems with this particular type of condition management in your population, but Mr. Jones here has uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and could really benefit from being started on this medication that he doesn't have evidence of contraindications for and so forth. What are you replacing, Chris? What, what, is, what is being used today that you guys are pushing kind of out to the side with, with your solution? Um, I don't think we're replacing anything. We're really trying to supplement the care that's given. I don't think that physicians can be expected to to try to absorb everything that is constantly being published, guidelines that are being updated every couple of years in all the different areas, 
and to you know, read these 83-page guidelines for one condition and then read them for all the conditions and try to remember all of that and apply it to the patient they see for seven minutes or 10 minutes and know the patient's data and which of the guidelines would be relevant to that person's care. So this is really to help the physician on the street know what to do. And who pays for this? Um, well, so our clients are anybody who bears risk. So if you take a, a health system, if they are bearing risk for their patient population and they're paying for our system, which is a software as a service based model, then when we find patients who should have certain interventions and that patient who is still in the low cost part of their population and hasn't had the stroke that leaves them in the 5% of the population costing, you know, the huge amount of healthcare dollars, then that's the benefit to the, the delivery system that's paying for it. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Elliot, please. Um, thank you very much for having me, I appreciate it. Uh, we are a full service pharmacy, as uh, Aaron said at the beginning. Um, so think CVS or Walgreens on the street corner. I think the big difference is that um, we prepackage all the medications the way that the patient's going to take it. So regardless of what the custom schedule is or the regimen, um, we can handle effectively any, uh, any regimen out there. And I think the bigger difference is that in order to achieve that, in order to create a coordinated care environment around your medications, we really have to solve a lot of the upstream service problems that today um, CVS and Walgreens and, and other big box retailers have just uh, not taken on. They've pushed that burden onto the patient. Um, and so these are things like coordinating with your physician to make sure that we're actually getting prescriptions for your medications. It's making sure that we're working with your insurance company to really understand what they will cover and not cover um, so that prior authorizations don't get in the way of you filling a medication or a refill too soon error on a billing claim. There's all kinds of these very opaque errors and they all translate to you not taking your medication. And so ultimately our mission in life is to make it delightful and simple to take and manage meds. And we believe if we do that, uh, people will actually adhere to their medication. And um, we I have started to see data that that is the case. So I think the good news is this really is starting to bear out. Um, and I think in many ways we're sort of users of some of the same ideas that Chris is talking about. Um, this is about really taking what is out there as evidence and guidelines and making sure that it actually gets followed and using technology to help operationalize those improvements. Do you, do you think of yourselves as a digital health solution or not necessarily, or a hybrid? No, actually, uh, about uh, 10 to 15 percent of our customers don't have an email address. So um, they're as non-digital as it gets. Uh, I think PillPack works for everybody. And um, we work very hard on that. So we do have a mobile app. And so for some people, it's a very digital experience. For others, uh, we interact with them over the phone and over mail. And um, I don't think it's a fundamentally worse or different experience, uh, depending on whether you use digital technologies or not. Behind the scenes, we're using a ton of digital technologies because uh, we do a lot more operational work than a normal pharmacy does. And um, the only way to make that viable in the current business model is to automate a ton of what happens behind the scenes and use technology to be really smart and efficient about where we use our resources. That allows us to reinvest that extra buffer uh, back into providing a better service experience for the consumer. Liz, if we can turn to you and uh, tell us a bit about Vocera maybe briefly, but then the Vocera um, Experience Network and what you guys do and how you work with, uh, with your customers. Sure. So I technically work for a technology company, and that company is Vocera Communications, which is a unified clinical communication and collaboration platform. Most people know it as the Star Trek-like badge where you can say, you know, get me the nurse on call and the workflow and stuff in the back end does that. I have absolutely nothing to do with the technology. I work in a group called the Experience Innovation Network, which is basically an, a research and advisory group within Vocera that works with health systems across the US and Canada around improving the human experience. So process change, technology adoption, change management uh, that solves for both challenges in the patient and family experience, but also looks at the physician and staff side of that equation so that you're not building solutions that patients love, but that are killing your doctors and nurses. Um, and what, when I, you know, I draw a lot on my experience from Forrester, where I started in 1999 looking at the, the digital health solutions. So back in the days of Rx.com and Bodybug and, you know, Pharmacy.com and, and MyPersonalHealthRecord.com and things that you guys probably, if you haven't been around as long as I have in this, 
have never heard of because they didn't go anywhere, many of which were, were nevertheless solving for, or trying to solve for real problems in healthcare. And so from that, I, th I think what I look at when I'm talking with my health system organizations or talking with anybody around digital health solutions, I kind of look at three areas that really make a difference. And the first area is alignment. Is the, the person or the entity doing the work, the person who gets the value, and the person who is paying, are those aligned? And more often than not, the, the provider system is being asked to do work that the payer system benefits from. And that's a non-starter. Uh, the second place I look is behavioral economics. So you may be solving for somebody's lifestyle choice, and they don't want to solve that lifestyle choice. Um, are they, you know, most people probably, most of us dramatically underestimate our poor health choices. We're really good at seeing them in other people. We're not so good in judging them in ourselves. So even if it's leading towards ostensibly better health, is it doing it in a way that actually captures what somebody wants to do? And that could be on the provider side as well. It, you know, the getting a lot of people paint doctors as technophobes. Doctors aren't technophobes. They're phobic of technology that takes somebody else's work and dumps it on their plate, right? Like an EHR or a prior auth system or something like that. So um, behavioral economics is the second arena. And then the, the last arena is workflow. And this is where I really see uh, providers on one side of the divide and often manufacturers and payers on the other side of the divide. The most effective digital solutions for healthcare that are truly changing the way that health is delivered depend on and, and connect to the interaction between the provider and the patient. And that is a workflow that it, the way that a doctor or a hospital or a system manages their workflow cannot be one way for one payer, another way for another payer, uh, unique for one manufacturer, whether that's a, you know, a pharma or a device. So you know, even where you look at something where something like Medicare or Medicaid may want something done a certain way, that still may be 30, 40% of your practice. You can't realign your practice workflow for 30 to 40% of your patients and do something completely different for 60%. You can't run a business that way. Nobody runs a business that way. So when I look at solutions in the digital health space, those are the kinds of things that I'm looking for. And just to give an example, in the, in the behavioral health or behavioral economics arena, um, often the, time, the way that you overcome some of that reluctance is by, and we heard this earlier today, marrying the digital and the human together. Because as humans, we're social creatures. We're, we are good at being accountable to one another. We're not good at being accountable to devices. So can you overcome some of that behavioral economic challenge by recognizing that digital doesn't exist in a vacuum? It belongs with other people. So. I hope that's helpful. Great, very, very helpful. Maybe switching from you know, a description of each of Chris and, and Elliot, your technology, to talk a bit about more of the barriers. You're both fairly young companies, so you are out there in the market with traction, um, but presumably you've run into some challenges as well. Could you talk about what some of those barriers have been for each of you, um, whether it's data, whether it's workflow, whether it's uh, behavioral-related uh, kind of challenges? Sure. Um, some of the barriers that we've been encountering, uh, one that gets back to what Jason was talking about on the previous panel, are the incentives that health systems have right now. Um, he dislikes measures that are really more process measures as opposed to looking at the quality of care provided. And so a lot of systems are, are just you know, have it in their mind, well, we have to improve these particular metrics that we're going to get money for. And so we don't really care if your system is going to improve the health of the patient. We just want to know, are you going to be able to improve our metrics? So wrong incentives, so wrong, <laughs> wrong metrics. Yeah. Which really gets towards the fact that I, I think we need a way of, you know, revising what kind of metrics these systems are being incentivized towards nationwide. Um, other kind of barriers, data, like you were mentioning, uh, data is still very siloed, that, and we're aggregating that. It's often like pulling teeth to get the different types of data for one particular population, even where they have supposedly an HIE um, or are working towards getting the data together in a data warehouse. They're like, oh, we're not actually sure what's in the data warehouse. We have a data warehouse. We don't, we don't keep labs, though. 
<laughs> you know, like, what, what's your data warehouse for if you don't have labs? Or we need labs, and then we get biometrics. We didn't really mean the biometrics alone. We want the creatinine and the potassium and so forth. And there's a, little, a lot of uh, difficulty with getting complete data. What about buy-in from whether it's the physicians or whether it's the health system <laughs> administrators or employers in the case of risk-bearing? Employers, yeah. how, how does how does that work? Um, so physicians, I think it depends on who you speak with. Um, a lot of physicians are are inundated from the the whole crying wolf phenomenon that they've been getting some sort of slip of paper from their insurance company that oh why don't you start an ACE inhibitor on that patient, which is not very specific to the patient at hand, and so they're used to just taking that and throwing it in the trash. And so it's a, a real barrier to trying to um, show people that we have an extremely specific system. We're looking at past adverse effects. We're looking at contraindications to potential drugs. We're looking at really the individual patient with all this data aggregated. And we're trying very hard not to give you the garbage that goes right into the trash. Uh, and so, you know, but um, and another barrier is that what's nobody really wants to log into yet another system. So I think in, in the end, ideally, we need a system that can be part of the EHR and um, part of that workflow that's already there. Of course, that takes, we don't want to wait another year or two before being able to provide insights to, to save patients' lives and, and so forth. So we would like people, clients right now, to log into another system to get the insights before we have integrated our, our insights into like an EMR. Elliot, how, how about on your end, Bill Pack? I, I think um, there's lots of little things that all add up to a lot of friction. I think the, uh, the thing that ties them all together is we're trying to create what feels like a delightful consumer experience, something that you might expect from Apple or from Amazon for that matter. And um, the system just was not designed to create good consumer experiences. It was designed for payers and for providers. And so something as simple as telling somebody the price of their medication, um, it's not possible today for me to tell you, uh, there, there's absolutely no way for anyone to know ahead of time what the cost of uh, their medication is going to be. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this is true, but, uh, but it's a fact. And we can use data science to guess at it and um, we can integrate with your payer, again, to guess at it, but that's actually what we're doing. We don't really know the price. And, um, and your payer doesn't know it either. Um, no one can tell you ahead of time what it's going to be, and that's crazy. Like, there's just nothing else that works that way. Um, in addition to that, you don't really understand what product you're ordering. It's a little bit like going online, and uh, you say you want to buy bed sheets and you decide that you want the green ones, and it's your doctor who decides whether you get the 600 count or the 900 count uh, you know, for thread count. And so, of course, when the retailer wants to tell you what the price is, they're like, well, now that I know you want the green one, let me go find out what thread count you are approved for. Um, and by the way, then after I figure that out, I'm gonna turn around and talk to your payer about which one they'll really pay for and what the price is gonna be. And the payer's gonna tell me, well, the price today is uh, actually not possible because you just bought bed sheets last month. You can't buy them yet. And uh, in two weeks, I'll be willing to tell you the price. So in two weeks, you check back in. You're like, cool, what's the price now? And they're like, well, the price today is $15. And so you tell all this to the consumer. And then a day later, the consumer says, okay, cool, yeah, I know I'm ready to buy it. And then a day later, the price is $400. And you're like, what happened there? <laughs> oh, you just hit your donut hole. And so now you're going to bear the full burden of the cost. It's really $400, it's not $15 anymore. Um, that is effectively how our payment system works today. And, um, you know, so, so these really simple things, and this, this exists across the spectrum, right? This is, has everything to do with what we pay for it, what the product's actually going to be, how it's going to show up to us. Um, these very, very basic questions that are really normal in any retail experience, very difficult to explain these uh, in a good consumer-driven way. I would say that's the core of the friction. Leslie, I just want to jump in on in that there, a, yeah. a little bit because I worked with a lot of PBMs and it was amazing to me how, shor how short-sighted and siloed um, some of them could be around some of this stuff. So you look at something like they wanted to build a digital app for adherence and you look at and polypharmacy being the people that they were most interested in, so people who have multiple medications. And you look at it and the rule, like 
most people don't get prescribed all their new medications on the same day and then go fill them all on the same day, which gives them all the same either 30 or 90 day window of when they are allowed to renew them. So they get staggered. So you end up with people having to buy them four or five times a month instead of just once a month, right? And so you say to a payer, if we want to solve that, it's not an app, it's allowing somebody to do a one-time reconciliation when they're on polypharmacy that says, we're going to bend the rules this once so that you can order all 10 of your medications on the same day instead of four or five times over the month. And they look at you like you're nuts, like this is impossible. This is just a rule that somebody put in place to prevent the excessive prescribing of medication. There's no, somebody in this plan has the power to change this rule. It's not an act of God. It's somebody's rule. And they, they look at you like there's no, absolutely no way we could move this or change it. Now, sometimes there are laws that will prevent certain things. But more often than not, it's a negotiation between the payer and whoever's behind the payer. And they just get stuck um, behind their own uh, uh, machinations and unable to see that we can solve these things. We can, not necessarily with the digital technology, but just by getting rid of the stupid rules or adjusting them in ways that make a more, that would allow you to say, you know what, you can buy not only your bed sheets, but your pillowcases and your comforter all and all of that time. all at the same time, instead of having to come down, come so, out three different times. So synchronization is at the heart of a lot of what PillPact is working on and, and uh, has built technology around solving. I, I will say that, um, so I think there's a really interesting example of why this stuff is hard to fix. And so before we turn this into a, a bashing on payers session to say something very nice about the payers, actually. So uh, this, this did change. So Medicare wrote a rule that said, no, sorry, this is not OK. Actually, it turns out medication synchronization saves everybody money, and you have to support it. And they created a special code where you can do this one-time synchronization. So this does actually exist. Most pharmacies don't know about it. Um, so uh, they haven't implemented it. But it turns out it doesn't really solve the problem. And the reason why is because we can't just synchronize things once because our medications change all the time. And so really the challenge is not synchronizing them a single time, it's how do I always move you toward being more synchronized? That's really what you want the system, how you want the system to behave. And to do that correctly, you have to coordinate with uh, the PBM who's approving the transaction, and you have to coordinate with the physician, and you have to coordinate with the consumer to align all of these things in the right way and start aligning all of their behaviors. And of course, behind the scenes, part of why the PBM is not going to just wave a magic wand and solve this is they're thinking to themselves, like, well, we're really just a transaction processor for most of our payers, really not the payer. The payer is a self-insured employer in most cases, or maybe Medicare. So we ultimately need them to agree to this, and they're the ones paying the bills. So you know, if they want to have a synchronization fee, which is going to cost them a little bit more money in the short term, but less money in the long term, it's kind of up to them. And I think in the same way that we talked about how a a uh, provider doesn't want to have to change behavior for 30% of the market, the PBM's thinking, like, I don't really want to change my behavior for what only 5% of my ultimate payers are going to approve. So ends up, you know, it's not really a solution, which is the frustrating part to all of us in this room who want to fix these things. But uh, we end up in the situation we're in, which is this really complicated system and an inability to create innovations that require so many different entities to coordinate with each other. And, and is the challenge, before we get into just, to your point, just bashing payers and, <laughs> and the getting frustrated around kind of the fragmentation of the system, is the challenge that, um, I mean, obviously we have a very fragmented system with a very siloed set of decision makers. Is the challenge for you guys that you just aren't yet of the scale where you can get to the senior enough folks that can impact and can make those changes that, that might make sense? And, and so, I, and I guess a flip question of that is, I don't know if you've had experience working with more integrated systems, whether it's a Kaiser or whether it's a VA or something like that, where it's all under one umbrella, and has that experience been a different experience? So most of the really integrated systems take Kaiser as, as an example. They own their own pharmacy, so it's not really clear how to work with them. Um, we could provide them with technical services. Maybe there's some component of what we do that we sort of license to them like a technology provider, but that's not truly the business we're in. We're in the business of being a pharmacy. So um, in theory, the integrated system should, should be a good fit for this, but they aren't necessarily. I think just to, to play out your question about uh, getting to the right person, let's just let, let's think about it. So, so let's just say, yeah, we were, we were man, we were 20% of the US market. We're massive. Mm -hmm. and that, that would be a humongous, that would be mm -hmm. you know, basically the second or third biggest player in the right. country. You'd be the second or third biggest pharmacy in the world. So massive scale. OK, but you're still 20% of the market. And you go to the head of 
some health plan and say, man, I have a really innovative idea for how to change care. We're going to make it more coordinated, and it's going to save you money over the long term. And they start thinking to themselves, like, well, it's not really going to save me money over the long term because I have to be at risk for it to save me money. So I guess it's a good service. I should offer this to my self-insured employer client base because it'll save them money. But you start, like, drawing out the Venn diagram here. It's got, like, six bubbles on it. And by the time you figure out what the overlap is, even if you're 20% of the market, the overlap's like 2% of the market. So they're kind of like, I don't know, yeah, that's not that exciting. Like, why would I go change these 40-year-old IT systems I have? It's gonna, that's tens of millions of dollars. Why would I do that for 2% of my business? It just doesn't make, I'm not going to. It doesn't make any sense. So I, I don't, it, you know, I think this is why it truly isn't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't want to sit here bashing them. I don't think it's their fault. Um, I think that's the result of a really fragmented system is, uh, it's not, it, there is no centers of gravity for anybody in the system. Liz, you work with a number of different uh, healthcare systems, healthcare providers. How, how do you see that playing out at the, at the provider level? Well, even, even at the provider level with many of the, the bigger systems, they still have their own silos and fragments, right? A hospital is a hospital is a hospital. And, and we work with, you know, we work with everyone from single hospitals to like an Ascension Health, which is hundreds of hospitals. And all of them are trying to figure out how to deal with their regional variation, their, their different markets, their different uh, components, the different leadership styles. How do you create a culture? You know, this, this whole one, you know, this one Ascension, one Providence, one kind of thing are all, all moving through the systems because they are having, even within these quote unquote controlled systems, an, an awful lot of variation. And what that means for the consumer is often that, um, that you can walk in the door in one place and walk in the door in, the, in another place with the exact same brand over it, and they have no idea. It's like the early days of the internet when, ladies, you'll understand this better than some of the men in the room, Victoria's Secret catalog and Victoria's Secret uh, <laughs> um, online were literally two completely separate operations and you couldn't return one thing in another place, so, or, and the store was yet another set of operations. Now they brought them all together because consumers demanded it. I think one of the challenges here is, you know, yes, the, the payers are fragmented, and yes, there are employers behind them that are driving the decisions that they're making, and the PBMs are all working for them. And for the consumers, we don't even have that much choice. My, I, have, I work for a California-based health uh, uh, company. I get two payers I can choose from, neither of them is the one that I want, and none of them is local. Because it's a, Cal they're picking, and I'm the outlier person who doesn't work in California. Right, so, so this, one of the things that I, that I think about when I'm thinking about this digital revolution is so much of the other digital revolution has been driven by this desire to and need to serve consumers and this sort of massification of the consumer voice that doesn't seem to happen in healthcare. I'm stuck with my payer, regardless of whether they're willing to think about synchronization, right, as something that would serve me better from both a health perspective and, a, and an experience perspective. I'm therefore stuck with certain providers um, unless I want to go completely out of pocket. It's just a really interesting, like, trying to figure out who actually has the power to drive the changes, to make the choices, and then what is the scale of that change. Even in a big system, it's probably you know, piece by piece by piece. Do we, do, do any of you see movement on the large payer side, um, whether it's CMS or whether it's some of the large PBMs, in your case, Elliot, or, or the healthcare sort of payers more broadly? And I'll, I'll cite one example, Aetna, you know, there's a rumor out there that Aetna is in discussions with Apple about putting a, a digital, the, the Apple Watch, to every one of their members. And I had the chance recently to sit with the CEO of Aetna, and he confirmed this is something they really want to do. Um, is, that, is that an interesting path forward? Does that make, does that make a potential impact? I, I don't know, to your specific business, if that, if that would. But I'd be curious as how you, how you see whether the, the payer is the, is the place to really un, untangle some of those barriers that, that you are all running against uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Anybody? <laughs> you know, I think that it, um, I was smiling because I thought that was already a done deal. I thought they already gave all their employees. They gave them already? Apple okay. Watches. That's, that's possible. <laughs> but, Any Aetna members here? <laughs> um, but, but I definitely think that if they have a lot of the information and wearable device information as well as their claims, that 
uh, one step in the right direction, they don't have access then to the EHR data in the case of what we're doing and, and so forth. You know, they don't have everything. It's definitely more challenging when you're working with a delivery system that has uh, this payer and that payer and the other payer and we switch from this one to that other one so you definitely can't get lab data for these people and so forth. I'll, I'll say something pessimistic and then, and then something often optimistic. So, uh, the healthcare system has not fundamentally reshaped payments. We, we are much more interested in paying for value. That part is happening, and it's a really big deal, and I don't want to understate it. But the idea of the, of the system becoming more consumer-driven has not really happened, and I don't think it's going to as long as the fundamental payments exist where they are today. So, you know, we thought with the ACA we might get real exchanges, and the exchanges might generate a whole new round of moving people towards truly selecting their own health plan so you don't end up with just two options. And that didn't really play out. And so I don't think anything is happening today that's gonna fundamentally make the process of consumerifying healthcare accelerate. That's the pessimistic thing. The really optimistic thing is, I do think that payers, a lot, uh, um, and I also think providers uh, like Kaiser or Partners or any other, I think they really believe that if they create great consumer experiences, they will improve people's health outcomes and it will be good for them on a business level. So I do think there is a massive acceleration happening right now of people saying, how do we build these really great consumer experiences in healthcare and really focus on that as a key goal? And that's the part that I think is really, really happening and we should be optimistic about it. I just don't know that it's going to, it's gonna take just as long as whatever the last revolution was because the systemic stuff has not been reshaped. And um, I want to add on to that, which is that, that I think the challenge, and, and I'm not anti-payer, I think payers do some great work, and I do think there needs to be a check and balance on the provider side where the incentive is often consume, although there's also a, a health motivation there. Um, but on the, the, the challenge I, I find on the payer side, at least thinking about the consumers, is if you look at the fundamental job that people hire a health insurer to do, it is to manage and make clear my health finances, keep them as low as possible, right? And to your example earlier, we can't tell you what it's gonna cost. They're failing at that job often for many, many reasons, many of which are, are valid, but it's still the system that we've created and that payers have agreed to be and the negotiations that they make with different, um, different stakeholders and, and what have you. And so when you get a payer that, that from the consumer perspective says F you on the fundamental job, that I've asked you to do. And then turns around and says, but let me intrude into the most intimate parts of your life and help you change your lifestyle so that you'll be happy, you'll be healthier. It just doesn't make any sense, right? So where I look for the innovation is, is I wanna see the innovations that, that do say things like synchronization. And I realize it's not, I'm painted it as a simpler picture than it is, but that are willing to say, we'll not only work on this side, but we're gonna work on the fundamental business component as well. We're, gonna, we're going to do a consumer-friendly job at the job you hired us to do, so that you will invite us in to the one you didn't hire us to do, but that makes awful good business sense for us. And I think until all entities are doing that kind of thing, we're not gonna see real consumer transformation. We'll turn this over to the, to the audience here in a, in a second, but you know, just to not end this on a totally pessimistic and negative note, um, I mean, I would note that you know, in spite of the challenges in this, in this sort of healthcare system that, that, that we live in, um, you know, innovations are happening. And whether they are you know, overlay, in a sense, you guys are overlaying on, on existing kind of enterprise and various kind of point solutions, or whether it's really designing a whole new delivery mechanism, as, as you have, Elliot, um, you know, innovations are, are occurring. Um, which, is, uh, which is somewhat heartwarming. I think the other uh, potential, you know, CMS seems to be taking more initiative than it has in the past in embracing some of, some of the digital technologies. We'll, we'll see kind of where that goes and certainly in modifying, starting to play with, uh, with modifying the payment um, mechanisms around that. Liz, I'm wondering if you, you know, you've, you've got a broad perspective, I think, to some degree on, from your Forrester days, from your, your days, uh, you know, here, what, what, do you see other bright lights in, in that, uh, sort of in that environment? In the payer environment specifically? Well, and in innovations that are able, in a sense, to make their way through in spite of the challenges. And yeah. we know there are many. Well, I think, I think innovations, I, I love innovations that are, that are taking the idea of data and turning it into in information. So, so solutions like Chris's that, um, that recognize that, you know, when you talk about things like giving every consumer an Apple Watch, I'm like, 
First of all, that's not the world's best health tracker. I've used many of them, and it's one of the worst. Second of all, um, and, and I wear one, I love it, right? It, but not as a health tracker. Um, second of all, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Uh, uh, yeah, you get all, okay, so you get all that data, but that's just, no doctor in the world has time to just sift through a bunch more data. So I think things that are, I am excited about, though it's sometimes overhyped, things like artificial intelligence, things that apply analytics to a bunch of data, assuming we can get it together and into the right place and that it is compatible, to try to drive um, targeted information. I still then look at, is that information consumable looking at that behavioral economics perspective? Is it giving people the right expectations? A lot of doctors think even if they're not with the guidelines, they're doing just fine because there has been and always probably will be an art to medicine and not everybody fits in the, in the data parameters, right? And, and, and we've prob we're probably too far in that art side and need to move more to the science side, but we need to change a culture to do that. And that's not gonna happen just with a technology. It's gonna happen um, with the combination of technology, change management, process approaches, things that, that really transform it. And putting, having providers at the table um, to be driving some of that innovation side by side with consumers, side by side with payers, which is a difficult thing to do because you need to get the, the critical mass, particularly of the payers. And as soon as you get the competitive components and the fragmentation starts to happen again, you start saying, okay, that's gonna happen in this one little pocket, but it's not gonna be widespread. So I ended on a pessimistic note. Yes, there are many, <laughs> <laughs> many solutions. And I do think the health trackers do give it, people, I love the passive, anything that's a passive tracker that I don't have to be doing a lot of work, but that gives me um, motivating interruptions, right? So where I, I'm actually wearing a second health monitor, I was talking with some people at lunch about this, this is a motive ring. It tracks my movement and my, um, my heart rate. This is more or less useless because it doesn't do any um, sorry, I hope there's no motive people in there. <laughs> because it doesn't do anything interruptive, it doesn't push me to do anything. This, while not a great tracker, does fireworks when I close my movement ring, right? That's kind of a little bit exciting, which is sad to say, but true, right? So I think we're, as we get more interface designers and people thinking about these behavioral economics and combining that with the deep analytics on the side to do intelligence, we will see some real transformations. And, and the... Technologies are maturing to do that. We just have to recognize that it takes more than the technology to get it done. Good. Maybe on that note, we open it up. We have a few minutes left for questions from the audience, wherever that, that cube is. Yes, sir. So the Elliot. cube is coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> so Elliot was the panel at large. So rumor has it that Amazon is looking at the, the pharmacy market. Um, what do you think of that play and how what, that kind of scale of change might affect other parts of the industry? I think it's awesome. We're, we're extremely excited. I hope the rumors are true. Um, you know, our whole goal in life is to create better consumer experiences. And the biggest friction is uh, having support upstream from us for the right access to information and data. And I think having more entities who are used to building really great consumer experiences come into healthcare, and particularly into pharmacy, is going to help encourage more of the ecosystem to, uh, to do that. So I think it's fantastic. I hope it happens. Yes, sir. <laughs> On the subject of syn Synchronization. Synchronization. Uh, <laughs> just a modest thought. When I pay my mortgage, I was asked, what day of the month would you like to pay your mortgage? <laughs> now, that's a monthly affair. This is a 30-day affair. But what if you changed 30 days to once a month and then asked the customer, what day would you like to pay or, and receive your pharmaceutical? If you started on, say, the third of the month, but you really wanted on the 15th, that first you know, period you could get a shortened dose regimen, and then on the 15th you start your monthly. And then you're in synchronization. 
uh, you'd have to change minds. I understand that's difficult to go from <coughs> 30 days to once a month, but if you did that, I think you've got your problem solved. That's, you just described pill pack. That's exactly how we work. So you just pick a day of the month. In fact, we have a lot of people on defined benefits and they get paid on a certain day of the month. And so that's the most convenient. There is a moment in the month when it's convenient for them to pay. And so we let them set that up. No, but it's still a 30 day supply and that changes over the course of the year. So it's not gonna be the same day every month. Uh, we decouple the payment from the dispensing. So uh, you can pay on well, the Well, I don't care about paying, I care about receiving. You wanna receive it on the same day. Yeah. yeah. Um, there would be a way to do something close to that, but I think in reality it would create a lot more confusion because it wouldn't quite work the right way every time. Um, and that's because uh, it would, it's a very uh, detailed question about exactly the way billing claims work in healthcare, but the net result would be that it would cost you more money and uh, it would not work quite as friction-free as you would want it to. So my guess is uh, getting it uh, every 30 days and, and decoupling the payment from that is gonna be a, a hunch is that's a better customer experience. Last question, yes sir. Uh, thank you for the great discussion. Um, so my question is basic, at the heart of entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship in general is uh, problem so uh, solving. So a lot of what I, and to solve any problem, you have to identify the problem. A lot of what I heard today is that, oh, this is a complex system, you know, everything is contributing to some degree to the problem. Uh, and if you think like that to me as an MIT uh, alum, you cannot really basically prescribe any solution. So I'm just curious, as entrepreneurs on this stage, uh, where do you think is basically the source of the problem or basically the place that we can have the, um, a major impact, uh, I can give you a clue. In the case of the Medicaid or uh, Medicare, the person who happens to pay the bill also has a complex relationship with the people who provide the, uh, provide the care, and these are the powerful people in any city, hospitals, doctors. So is there a fundamental conflict of interest there? Uh, or I'm just, I'm just curious to know what, is your, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the major source of the problem? Thank you. <laughs> That's a big question. Do you guys want to, any, any, I, well, I assume I'll just, the. I'll yeah. just say, for entrepreneurs, it is really easy to look at healthcare and see many of the pieces that are broken. The important thing is to really trace back to what are the various stakeholders who both have a stake in the status quo, right? One person's saved cost is another person's lost revenue, um, as well as what are the, who are the various bodies in the regulation? Until and unless we blow up the entire system and get rid of our, you know, have a single payer system or things like that, it's gonna continue to be this complicated. And it is phenomenally intellectually challenging and stimulating to try to solve a problem where the problem is really clear, but the contributing factors are multitudinous. And so I would just say, if you see the problem, don't think it's just that simple to fix it. You have to look at all of the pieces and where the alignment happens, what the behavioral economics components are, what the workflow implications are, and if you can solve for that, then you get solutions like PillPack that really do create a solution to the, the challenge of, of polypharmacy and, and making it clear. Most of us on the third, who's taken antibiotics ever in your life, right? <laughs> on the third day, can you remember if you took the lunchtime dose? No, this totally solves for that by putting it in a little thing that's got a date label on it, right? Great solution, but they had to think through all of the things of being a retail pharmacy and what, what, what happens if you decouple payment from those. They had to get into that complexity. You have to get your hands dirty and look at all of those pieces to actually solve the problem. Seeing the problem easy, solving the problem much more challenging, but totally exciting. But I would just end on the note of saying, look, I think there are plenty of, of entrepreneurial opportunities. You're seeing a couple of them you know, on, the, on the stage here and plenty that both tackle the question of better outcomes and driving costs down, which hopefully you know, is, a, is a goal for most healthcare endeavors. It is not necessarily for all, um, in spite of all the, all the barriers and the constraints. But I think the, the, the point that you know, we've kind of been obviously raising here of we've got a, a challenging system that we're operating within <laughs> Um, one of the frustrations I have is that there are very few people looking at models in other countries and looking at those as examples of how do you, how do you get much better outcomes or similar outcomes for half the cost. And that, that, is, uh, that is not a question that's being certainly debated in today's Washington as far as I can tell. 
Anyway, thank you all very, very much. Thank you for the panel for taking the time and um, good afternoon.